A Horus Heresy Short Story The Lightning Tower By Dan Abnut What are you afraid of? What are you really afraid of? There was once a fine palace, and it sat like a crown of light upon the top of the world. This was in the latter days, when mankind had left his birth rock for the second time, to chase a destiny denied him in a previous epoch. The artisan masters of the many rival Masonic guilds had raised the palace up, block by gilded block, to be a statement of unity, regal and unequivocal. After a dreary, lightless age of strife, the warring tribes and creeds of Terra had been alloyed under one rule, and the palace was intended to symbolize that staggering achievement. All of the petty dynasts and ethnarchs, all the clan nations and gene septs, all the despots and pan-continental tyrants, had been quelled or crushed, overthrown or annexed. Some, the smartest and most prescient of them, had offered terms and been embraced to the bosom of the new rule. Better fealty than the wrath of the warriors in thunder armor. Better submission than the enmity of the world's new master. It was said that once you had seen him or heard him speak, you were never going to doubt him again. He was the one, and had always been the one. He had been the emperor long before there was any such office to take. No one knew his birth name, because he had always, naturally, been the emperor. Even the artisan masters of the Masonic guilds, famous for their sanctimonious craft wars and vainglorious quarrels, had shut up and in concert built the palace for him. It was monumental. It was not so much an edifice as a handcrafted landmass. The artisan masters built it upon Terra's greatest mountain range, and transformed the monstrous peaks into its bulwarks. It towered above a world laid to waste by centuries of war and perdition. And though that world was being rebuilt, with wondrous cities and architectural marvels blooming in the new age of unity, nothing could match its magnificence. For it was beautiful, a euphoric vision of gold and silver. It was said that when they finished the task, the artisan masters of the Masonic guilds set down their tools and wept. By the time it was complete, it was the largest man-made structure in known space. Its footing sank deep into the planet's mantle. Its towers probed the airless limits of the atmosphere. It owned the words, the palace, wholly, without any need for qualification, as if no other palaces even existed. He had blemished that glory. He had raised dark curtain walls around the golden holes and cased the soaring towers in skins of armor ten meters thick. He had stripped away the jeweled facades and the crystallophantine ornamentation, the delicate minarets and the burnished cupolas, and in their place he implanted uncountable turrets and ordnance emplacements. He had dug mighty earthworks out of the surrounding lowlands and fortified them with a million batteries. He had yoked platforms into synchronous orbit to guard from above, their weapon banks armed and trained night and day. He had put his men upon the walls, armored in gold, and set for the coming war. His name was Dorn, and he was not proud of his work. Vadok Singh, the war mason, had a habit of stroking the architectural plans as he laid them out, as if they were a favored pet. Necessity, he said, his favorite word, stroking out the revised schemata of the Dwalagiri elevation. It is ugly, said Dorn. He stood away from the table, leaning against one of the planning chamber's thick columns, arms folded across his broad chest. Ugly is what they will do if they find the Annapurna gate weak and flimsy, Singh replied. He stood back and lit his pipe from a taper, allowing his flock of slaves to finish laying out the designs and adjusting the brass armature of the viewing lenses that would magnify details and project them onto the chamber wall for a closer examination. Dorn simply shrugged. It is still ugly. The orbis and lazulite works encrusting that gate took Menzo the Travert thirty years to complete. Pilgrims flock here simply to see it. 
They say it surpasses even the eternity gate in its aesthetic. Aesthetic? No. Singh smiled. He began to pace, trailing blue smoke from the bowl of his long-stemmed pipe. The slaves followed him up and down the chamber, like a timorous litter of young following their mother. Singh was a tall man, almost as tall as the Primarch, but skeletally thin. His guild gene bred their bloodline to favor height for purposes of surveying and overseeing. I so love our conversations, Rogel. They are quite contrary. You the warrior, and me the craftsman, and you lecture me on aesthetics. I am not lecturing, Dorn replied. He was aware of Sigismund and Archamus in the corner of the great room, stiffening at the war mason's use of his forename. Dorn would hear about proper respect and protocol later. Oh, of course you're not, said Singh. But it is a necessity. How many legions does the upstart have with him now? Dorn heard Sigismund rise to his feet. He turned and stared at the first captain of the Imperial Fists. Sigismund glowered back for a second and then left the chamber. Dorn glanced back at the war mason. Too many, he said. Singh held out a long, spindly arm in the direction of the schemata. So? Begin work tomorrow at sunrise. Dismantle the gate with care and store the dismantled elements in the vaults. We will put the work back when this is done. Singh nodded. We will put everything back, thought Dorn. When this is done, we will put everything back the way it was. A catabatic wind was coming in off the lower bulwarks that night. The palace was so immense, the precipice walls bred their own microclimate. Greasy stars swam in the heat ripple of the palace's new reactors. The void shields were being tested again. Not a palace. Not the palace anymore. A fortress now. Some of those sullen stars were orbital platforms, catching the last backscatter of the sunlight as Terra turned. Dorn put on a fur-edged robe, which had been in his possession since his adolescence on Inuit, and went out to walk the parapets of the Dawalagiri Prospect, to dwell upon its beauty one last time. It was one of the last sections of the palace that remained untouched. Adamantium armor plates, drab rock wreath and auto turrets had yet to blight its ethereal lines. Soon, though. From the wall, Dorn could see the half a million campfires of the Masonic host, the labor army that would invade the prospect come sunrise, with their mallets and chisels and cranes. The robe had been his grandfather's, though Dorn had long since understood that no ties of blood linked him to the Inuit ice cast which had raised him. He had been created from another genetic line, that most singular line, in a sterile vault deep beneath him in a buried core of the palace. Not a palace. Not the palace anymore. A fortress now. Dorn had been built to rule, built to assist in his father's tireless ambition, built to make the hard decisions. He had been made a Primarch, one of the only twenty in the galaxy, engineered by the Master of Humanity, the Archmason of Genetic Code. The Imperium needs many things, but foremost, it needs the ability to protect itself, to attack when necessary. That's why I gave it twenty strong teeth in its mouth. Attacking was a remarkably easy thing to do. Dorn's physical prowess humbled all but twenty human beings in creation. And those twenty were his father and nineteen brothers. In Dorn's opinion, the real art was knowing when not to attack. His grandfather, the old Inuit sire, patriarch of the Ice Hive clan, had taught him that. Dorn had been the seventh son to be reclaimed. By the time his father's forces found him, he had already become a system warlord in his own right, ruling the Inuit cluster as the head of the House of Dorn. His grandfather had been dead forty winters by that point, but still the warlord slept with the furage robe across his body at night. His people had called him Emperor, until the true meaning of the title had been demonstrated by a thousand warships in the Inuit sky. 
Dorn had gone out to meet his father aboard the Phalanx, one ship against thousands. But what a ship! A fortress! His father had been impressed. Dorn had always excelled in the construction of fortresses. That was why Dorn had returned to Terra with his gene sire. Out of love, out of devotion, out of obedience, yes, but most of all, out of necessity. Damn Singh! The stars had turned over, and chaos spilled out from under them. The brightest of all had fallen, and the unthinkable, the heretical, had become fact. The Imperium was attacking itself. The War Master, for reasons Dorn was quite at a loss to fathom, had turned upon their father, and was committing his forces to all-out war. And that war would come to Terra. There was no question about that. It would come, and Terra needed to be ready. The palace needed to be ready. His father had asked him, as a personal boon, to return to Terra and fortify it for war. No better man for the job. No better master of defense. Dorn and the Fists, appointed the Emperor's Praetorians, could fend off any attack. Below him, the halls of Terra were now silent, and the walls were deep. The only sound was the distant eternal hum of the Astronomicon. The palace that Dorn had armored and defaced sat like a dark crown upon the top of the world. Rogel Dorn had built many of the best strongholds in creation. The city fortresses on Zavamunda, the pylon spire of Galant, the dungeons along the roof and marches, impregnable bastions all, palaces for governors and lords to rule from. None of them had been as essential as this fortification. None of them had been as painful to accomplish. It had been like blotting out the light or draining a sea. The bright glory of his father's triumph, the enduring monument to unity, had been entombed inside a crude shell of utilitarian defense. All this because of Horus, because of the brightest bastard son, the bringer of new strife. Dorn heard stone splinter. He looked down. He had punched his fist, his imperial fist, through a block of stone in the parapet. He'd barely registered the impact, but the block was pulverized. My lord, is everything all right? Archemus had shadowed him from the planning chamber. Never so volatile as Sigismund, Archemus was a master of Dorn's Huskarl retinue. There was a worried look upon Archemus's face. Just venting my emotions, Dorn said. Archemus regarded the splintered block. Making work for Singh's artisans, then? Something like that. Archemus nodded. He hesitated, and looked out over the high walls towards the distant earthworks of the Mahabharat. You have wrought a wonder, you know. I have ruined one. I know you hate it, but it had to be done, and no one could have done it better. Dorn sighed. You are kind, old friend, but my heart is lead. This should have never been necessary. I search the limits of my imagination, and still I can conceive of nothing that begins to explain this war. Pride, ambition, insult, jealousy, they are not enough, not nearly enough for a Primarch. They are too petty and mortal to drive a Primarch to this extremity. They might provoke an argument, a feud at the worst. They wouldn't split the galaxy in half. Dorn looked up at the night sky. And yet, against all reason, he is coming. Gilliman will stop him. Robut is far away. Rust then, the lion, the Khan. Dorn shook his head. I don't think they will stop him either. I think he will roll on until he reaches us. Then we will stop him, said Archemus. Won't we, sir? Of course we will. I just wish. What? Nothing. You wish what, sir? Archemus asked. Nothing. 
the wind suddenly pulled at Dorn's robe. Above them, the shields went out and then test-fired again. Can I ask you a question, sir? Archamus asked. Of course. Who are you really afraid of? Consider the question, Rugal Dorn. The first axiom of defense is to understand what you defend against. What are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? Dorn paced the halls of the Kafmandau precinct where the organs of the Adeptus Terra did their work. The precinct, an entire city contained within the terraced compounds of the inner palace, never slept. Robed clerks and burnished servitors bustled along the broad concourses. Ministers and ambassadors conducted business beneath the kilometer-high roof of the hegemon. The great mechanisms of the Imperium whirred about him, its relentless function like a ticking timepiece. This was what unity had brought. This and a near measureless expanse of planets and dominions that it guided and administered. For two centuries, the Emperor and the Primarchs had fought to create the Imperium. They'd waged the Great Crusade from star to star, to forge the Empire of Man, an epic undertaking they had all made without hesitation, because they believed, with utter conviction, in the bright destiny it would shape for the species. They had all believed, all of them. What was he afraid of? Who was he afraid of? Angron? Not him. Dorn would split his head without compunction if they came face to face. Lorgar? Magnus? There had always been a fetid whiff of sorcery about those two, but Dorn felt nothing towards them that he could describe as fear. Fulgrim? No. The Phoenician was a singular foe, but not an object of terror. Perturabo? Well now, their rivalry was old, the spiteful scrapping of two brothers who fought for a father's attention. Dorn smiled despite his mood. His years of exchanged insults with Perturabo seemed almost comical compared to this. They were too much alike, too jealous of one another's abilities. Dorn knew it was a weakness for him to have risen to the Iron Warrior's baiting, but competing had always been a motivating factor between the Primarch brothers. It had been encouraged as a factor to drive them on to greater and yet greater accomplishments. No, he was not afraid of Perturabo. Horus Lupercal, then? Dorn's aimless wanderings had taken him to the investiary. In that broad space, an amphitheater open to the night sky, statues of the twenty stood on plinths in a silent ring. There was nobody around. Even the custodian god was absent. Lumen orbs glowed on black iron poles. The investiary was two kilometers in diameter. Under the glittering stars, it felt like an arena, where twenty warriors had gathered to make combat. The second and the eleventh plinths had always been vacant for a long time. No one ever spoke about the two absent brothers. Their separate tragedies had seemed like aberrations. Had they, in fact, been warnings that nobody heeded? Sigismund had urged that the effigies of the traitors also be removed from the investiary. He had offered to do the work himself. This, Dorn recalled, had made the Emperor laugh. For the time being, the traitors had simply been shrouded. Their towering, draped forms seemed like phantoms in the blue darkness. Horus, then? Was it Horus? Perhaps. Dorn knew that Horus was the greatest of them, which also made him the gravest foe. Could any of them hope to best Lupercal on the field of war? Martial prowess was hardly the point. Dorn had never feared an opponent in his life because of how strong they were or how hard they fought. Combat was only ever a test. What mattered, what engendered fear, was why an opponent fought. What made him fight? Oh, now we have it. Now the truth dawns. He felt the hairs on his skin rise. I am not afraid of Horus. I am afraid of finding out why he has turned against us. I cannot conceive of any justification to this schism, but Horus must have a reason. 
I am afraid that when I know them, when they are explained to my baffled mind, I might even agree. Would you tear them all down? Doran turned at the sound of the voice. For a moment, it sounded like the soft growl of his father. But it was only a man, a cloaked and cowled man, barely half Doran's height. His robes were those of a simple palace administrator. What did you say? Dorn asked. The man walked out into the circle of the investiary to face Dorn. He greeted him in the old salute of unity rather than the sign of the Aquila. You were staring at the statues of your kin, he observed. I asked, would you tear them all down? The statues or my kin, Sigilite, Dorn replied. Both, either. The statues, perhaps. I believe Horus is doing a fine job with the men themselves. Malkador smiled and looked up at Dorn. Like Dorn's, his hair was white. Unlike Dorn's, it was long like a mane. Malkador was an exceptional being. He had been with the Emperor from the inception of the Unification Wars, serving as aide, confidant and advisor. He had risen to become the master of the Council of Terra. The Emperor and the Primarchs were genetically advanced post-humans, but Malkador was only a man, and that was what made him exceptional. He stood on a par with the post-human masters of the Imperium, and he was only a man. Will you walk with me, Rogaldorn? Are there not matters of state requiring your attention, even at this hour? The council will bemoan your absence from the debating table. The council can manage without me for a little while, Malkador replied. I like to take the air at this time of night. The Imperium never rests, but at night... Up here in the thin air of old Himalaysia, I find there is at least an illusion of rest, a time to think and free the mind. I walk, I close my eyes, the stars do not go out because I'm not looking at them. Not yet, anyway, said Dorn. Malkador laughed. No, not yet. They said little in the beginning. They left the investiary and walked along the beige stones of the precinct highest terraces, between the weeping fountains. They walked as far as the Lion's Gate, onto the platforms that overlooked the docking rings and landing fields of the Brahmaputra Plateau. The gate had once been a thing of magnificence. Two gilded beasts rising up to lock claws in a feral dispute. Dorn's order of works had replaced them with giant great dungeons stippled with crenellations and macro gun ports. A curtain wall of bleak rockrete encircled the gate, its edge fletched with void field veins like the spines of some prehistoric reptile. They stood and considered it for a long time. I am not a subtle man, Malkador said at length. Dorn raised his eyebrows. Oh, all right, said Malkador. Perhaps I am. Guile comes easily to a politician. I know I am considered cunning. An old word, with no more meaning than wise, Dorn replied. Indeed, I will accept that as a compliment. All I meant to say was, I will not attempt to be subtle now. No. The Emperor has expressed concerns. Meaning what? Dorn asked. Malkador answered with a slight sigh. He understands that you are filled with misgivings. Only natural, I would think, given the circumstances, said Dorn. The Sigilite nodded. He trusts you to undertake the defense. He is counting on you. Terra must not fall, no matter what Horus brings. This palace must not fall. 
If it is to end here, then it must end in our triumph. But he knows, and I know, and you know, that any defense is only as strong as its weakest part. Faith, belief, trust. What are you telling me? If there is doubt in your heart, then that is our weakness. Dorn looked away. My heart is sad because of what I have been made to do to this place. That is all there is. Is it? I don't think so. What are you really afraid of? Falcador raised his hand and the lights in the chamber came on. Dorn looked around. He had never entered the Sigilites' private apartments before. Ancient images hung on the walls, flaking, fragile things of wood, canvas, and decomposing pigment, preserved in thin blue fields of stasis. The smoke-pale portrait of a woman with the most curious smile. Garish yellow flowers rendered in thick paint. The unflinching, roimy gaze of an old fleshy man, cast in shadow tobacco brown. Along another wall hung old tattered banners showing the thunderbolt and lightning strike sigil of the pre-unity army. Suits of armor, perfect, glinting thunder armor, were mounted in shimmering suspension zones. Malkador offered Dorn some wine, which he refused, and a seat, which he accepted. I have made a certain peace with myself, Dorn said. I understand what I am afraid of. Malkador nodded. He pulled back his cowl and the light shone on his long white hair. He sipped out of the glass. All right, enlighten me. I do not fear anyone. Not Horus, not Fulgrim, none of them. I fear the cause. I fear the root of the enmity. You fear what you don't understand. Exactly. I am at a loss to know what drives the War Master and his cohorts. It is an alien thing to me, defying translation. A strong defense relies on knowing what you are defending against. I can raise all the bulwarks and curtain walls and cannon bastions I want, and still I won't know what it is I'm fighting. Perceptive, said Malkador. And true of us all. I fancy even the Emperor doesn't fully understand what it is that drives Horus against us so furiously. Do you know what I think? Tell me. Malkador shrugged. I believe it is better that we don't know. To understand it would be to understand insanity. Horus is quite mad. Chaos is inside him. You say that as if chaos is a thing. It is. Does that surprise you? You've known the warp and seen its corrupting touch. That is chaos. It has touched humanity now, twisted our best and brightest. All we can do is stay true to ourselves and fend it off, to deny it. Trying to understand it is a fool's errand. It would claim us as well. I see. Don't see, Rogaldorn, and you will live longer. All you can do is acknowledge your fear. That's all any of us can do. Recognize it for what it is. Your pure human sanity, rocked by the sight of the warp's infecting, suffocating madness. Is this what the Emperor believes? Dorn asked. It is what he knows. It is what he knows he doesn't know. Sometimes, my friend, there is salvation in ignorance. Dorn sat still for a while. Malkador watched him, sometimes sipping out of his glass. Well, I thank you for your time, sir, said Dorn eventually. Your candor, too. I should... There is one other thing, said Malkador, setting the glass down and rising to his feet. 
Something I wish to show you. Falcador crossed the chamber and took something from a drawer in an old bureau. He walked back to Dorn and spread that something out onto the low table between them. Dorn opened his mouth, but no sound issued. Fear gripped him. You recognize these, of course. Old cards, worn and fraying, discolored and liver-spotted with time. One by one, Malkador laid them out. The lesser Arcanoi, just gaming trinkets, really, but used widely before the coming of Old Knight for divination. This deck was made on Nostromo Quintus. He used them, Dorn breathed. Yes, he did. He relied on them. He believed in cartomancy. He dealt his fate out, night after haunted night, and watched how the cards fell. Oh, holy Terra! Are you all right? Malkador asked, looking up. You look quite pale. Dor nodded. Curse! Oh, yes, curse. Had you forgotten him, or simply blocked him out? You have bickered and sparred with many of your brothers over the years, but only Conrad Kurz ever actually hurt you. Yes. He nearly killed you, as I recall. Indeed. On Chero, long ago. I remember it well enough. Malkador looked up at Dorn. The Primarch had risen to his feet. Then sit back down and tell me, because I wasn't there. Dorn sat. This is so long ago, it feels like another life. We had brought the Chero system to compliance. It was hard fought. The Emperor's children, the Night Lords, and my legion. We affected compliance. But Kurz didn't know when to stop. He never knew when to stop. And you rebuked him? He was an animal. Yes, I rebuked him. And then Fulgrim told me. Told you what? Dorn closed his eyes. The Phoenician told me what Kurz had told him. The fits, the seizures that had played Kurz since childhood on Nostromo. The visions. Kurz said that he saw the galaxy in flames. The Emperor's legacy overthrown. Astartes turning on Astartes. It was all lies. An insult to our creed. And you confronted Kurz. And he attacked me. He would have killed me, I think. He is insane. That's why we drove him out, sick of his bloodletting. That's why he burned his homeworld and took the Night Lords into the darkest parts of the stars. Malkador nodded and continued dealing the cards. Rogel, he is what you are truly afraid of, because he is fear incarnate. No other Primarch uses terror as a weapon like Curse does. You are not afraid of Horus and his heretics. You are afraid of the fear that sides with him, the night terror that advances alongside the traitors. Dorn sat back and breathed out. He has haunted me, I confess. All this time, he has haunted me. Because he was right. His visions were true. He saw this heresy coming in his visions. That is the truth you fear. You wish you had listened. Dorn looked out at the cards laid out on the table. Do you believe in divination, Sigilite? Oh, let's see, said Malkador, turning the cards over one by one. The moon, the martyr, and the monster. The dark king askew across the emperor. One other card. The Lightning Tower. Dorn groaned. A bastion blown out by lightning. 
a palace brought to ruin by fire. I have seen enough. This card has many meanings, said Malkador. Like the death card, it is not as obvious as it might seem. In the hives of Nord America, it symbolized a change in fortune, an overturning of fate. To the tribes of the Frank and Tali, it signified knowledge or achievement obtained through sacrifice. A flash of inspiration, if you will, one that tumbles the world, you know, down, but leaves you with a great gift. The Dark King lies across the Emperor, Dorn said, pointing. Malkador sniffed. Well, it isn't exactly a science, my friend. They had blown their way through the massive Urfork defenses at Haldwani and Zigaze. The sky at the top of the world was on fire. Despite the bombardments of the orbital platforms and the constant sorties of the Stormbirds and the Hawkwings, the traitor legions advanced, up through the Brahmaputra, along the delta of the Karnali. Continental firestorms raged across Gangetic Plain. As they entered the rampart outworks of the palace, the streaming, screaming multitudes and the striding war machines were greeted by monsoons of firepower. Every emplacement along the Dawalagiri Prospect committed its weaponry. Lass reached out in neon slashes, annihilating everything it touched. Shells fell like sleet. Titans exploded, caught fire, collapsed on their faces, and crushed the warriors that were swarming around their heels. But still they came. Lancing beams struck the armor-reinforced walls like lightning, like lightning smiting a tower. The walls fell. They collapsed like slumping glaciers. Gold-encased bodies spilled out, tumbling down in the deluge. The palace began to burn. Primus Gate fell. Lion's Gate, subjected to attack from the north. Anapurna Gate. At the ultimate gate, the traitors finally sliced into the palace, slaughtering all that they found inside. Around every broken gate, the corpses of titans piled up in vast, jumbled heaps where they had fallen over one another in their desire to break in. The heretic host clambered across their carcasses, pouring into the palace, yelling out the name of their... End simulation, said Dorn. He gazed down at the hololithic table. At his command, the forces of the enemy withdrew, unit by unit, and the palace rebuilt itself. The smoke cleared. Reset parameters to Horus, Perturabo, Angron, and Kurz. Opposition? The table queried. Imperial fists, blood angels, and white scars. Resume and replace scenario. The map flickered, the armies advanced, and the palace began to burn again. Play it out, simulation after simulation, if you like said the voice behind them. Simulations are just simulations. I know that you won't fail me when the time comes. Dorn turned. I would never knowingly fail you, father, he said. Then don't be afraid. Don't let fear get in the way. What are you afraid of? What are you really afraid of? The Lightning Tower, thought Rogel Dorn. I understand its meaning. Achievement obtained through sacrifice. I am just afraid of what the sacrifice would be. The End You have listened to A Horus Heresy Short Story, The Lightning Tower Written by Dan Abnett